Hello, I'm Dennis Raman Vidya, and today we are going to discuss a lot of things about clean code. Why clean code is not a is not a norm? What is a clean code? And how do we finally achieve our dream of clean code in our production? You know, every person, I believe everyone, had an initial shock when they joined a new job and finally see that even if it is, I don't know, Facebook or Microsoft, the code is still far away from that you have actually expected from. So today, Shandor is going to teach us what to do if code does not conform to our internal standards of clean code and what is clean code. Shandor, you're welcome. Thank you, Dennis. Hello everyone. So today we are going to discuss about why clean code is uh, still not the norm. Our main points will be what's software quality and what's clean code. Is there any relationship between quality and clean, clean code? And after all, what can we do about, uh, about these things? What can we do about them? But before we jump uh, into the middle, let me introduce myself. So my name is Shandor Dargo and I work as, uh, as a principal engineer, mostly with C++ in, uh, in the travel industry. And I spend most of my, yeah, well, not all, but most of my free time uh, writing uh, about uh, C++, sometimes about, a bit about Stoic philosophy, and definitely the books that, uh, that I read. Feel free to, to check out uh, my blog. We used to like to travel a lot before COVID. So, well, we would still like, but uh, things are a bit uh, more uh, more difficult. And uh, well, we try to enjoy ourselves a lot in the in the kitchen with uh, with my two small kids. And uh, you might uh, well, let's hope not, but you might see them uh, later during the talk if they manage to run in. But that's uh, more than uh, enough uh, about me. Let's have a quick look at the agenda. So first, we are going to discuss about software quality and about quality in general. Then we see what is clean code. We'll see if they relate to each other. And then we'll ask the question, why don't we write clean code? What's, uh, what are the reasons behind and uh, who, are, uh, who are the faulty ones? Well. We'll, we'll see. Many people, they say, it's them, it's them, it's them. But uh, we'll see that it's, uh, it's never them. And at the end, the question is, after all, what's, what's our job? What should we do about, uh, about clean code? You might ask, why, why did I want to talk uh, about clean code at the C++ conference? Or why do I want to talk about clean code and software quality? in general. Well, clean code is still not uh, the, the standard and we often uh, don't agree on what quality is. We don't agree. Developers don't agree. They cannot agree uh, whether clean code is part of software quality and what is software quality. And uh, I think we should discuss more about this, about uh, these topics. And uh, even though we have uh, some very technical we have a very technical conference with lots of interesting uh, deep technical talks. I think uh, these meta topics are also important to, to discuss. And uh, when it comes to quality, bugs and uh, clean code, well, you know, people always prefer blaming over taking responsibility. And uh, in fact, it's not only about uh, clean code or quality, it's, uh, it can be about uh, just anything. And uh, I think it's important that uh, we, we understand our responsibility as software developers when it, uh, when it comes to, to quality. So, is clean code part of software quality? That's, that's our first big question. Can we answer that? Well, in order to answer that, we should be able to understand what is clean code and what is software quality. But uh, we don't have a common understanding of that. Because uh, some even says that uh, software quality is just a meaningless marketing term. Maybe it's a bit shocking when, uh, when I say so. But, but it's not something that, uh, in fact, I came up with. 
if we consider the, the words of the author, Derek Jones, who wrote evidence-based software engineering based on the publicly available data, well, he said something very interesting. Let me switch here and, uh, and quote his words. People in the industry are very interested in software quality. And sometimes they have the confusing experience of talking to me about it. My first response on being asked about software quality is to ask what the questioner means by software quality. After letting them fumble around for 10 seconds or so, trying to articulate an answer, I offer several possibilities, which they are often not happy with. Then I explain how software quality is a meaningless marketing term. This leaves them confused and unhappy. People have a yearning for software quality, which makes them easy prey for snake oil salesmen. So this is uh, something from, uh, sorry, I lost there. This is something from, uh, wow, sorry for that uh, glitch, from, uh, from a well-published uh, and well-renowned author on uh, who who actually knows a lot about software quality and knows a lot about how to write uh, clean code. Yet he says that, uh, well, it's probably just a meaningless uh, marketing term. And the reason is that, uh, well, it means something different to everyone. Well, maybe not to everyone, but uh, it means many different things for a uh, lot, uh, lot of people. And as such, it's quite uh, difficult to talk about uh, to talk about quality and uh, it uh, in, in certain situations with certain people it might become meaningless but uh, we should try to define uh, what software quality is for us and uh, for that well let's try to discuss about quality first not software quality just quality and uh, you might have heard about uh, this uh, book, which was written, I think, in the, in the 70s or maybe the beginning of 80s, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that it's not about Zen and it's not about motorcycle maintenance either, although both appear in it uh, a little bit. But if you check the subtitle, which I'm not sure if you can uh, read here, it's about an inquiry into values. In fact, uh, the author, who was a philosopher, Robert Piercig, he tries to define what, uh, what is quality. And he took a few hundred pages uh, for that. And in fact, I think he took uh, many, many years of his life to think about quality. And what he came up with is uh, not something assuring for us. Because he said that uh, quality is basically undefinable. It's something that you will recognize when you see it, but you cannot, uh, you cannot really define it. And uh, yet he tried to come up with uh, different uh, categories, with different uh, categorizations for, uh, for quality. And he said that, uh, well, we can uh, distinguish between classical quality and romantic quality. And classical quality is uh, mostly about the engineering aspects, how things uh, work, how they are put together, why uh, they are functioning as, uh, as they function. Whereas the romantic quality is about uh, how things are used, not how they work, but how they are used. And uh, it also includes uh, design and, uh, and aesthetics. Now here we don't, uh, when we read, when we hear design and aesthetics, you might think about, uh, okay, the design of my code, the aesthetics of my code, but it's really not the case. Uh, if you think about the romantic quality, it will rather be the design of, uh, of your application how the UI uh, looks like, how, how aesthetic it is. 
And when you think about uh, clean code, when you think about uh, how your software is built, well, that's, uh, that's the classical quality. And uh, in fact, here the second boot called uh, Lila, which is also quite uh, interesting at some places, even uh, frightening, but uh, he managed to come up with uh, even more, even more categories for quality. Uh, I'll not uh, go into details about them, but uh, just uh, let me enumerate them so you can think about it later if, uh, if you wish. You have inorganic, biological, social, intellectual qualities, and even, uh, even so-called dynamic quality, which uh, would make this talk, I think, uh, really, <laughs> really more difficult. But uh, let's, uh, let's stay with the classical and romantic qualities. So you see uh, here, when we talk about clean code, we rather focus on the classical quality. But uh, not everyone defines software quality in terms of that. In terms of uh, in terms of classical quality, because if we check what is software quality, well, if we want to check some definitions, let's say from, uh, for example, from Wikipedia, we'll find uh, very different uh, definitions. If we check uh, the one of uh, the ISO, the International Standardization Organization, it says that software quality is capability of a software product to conform to requirements. While for others, it can be synonymous with customer or value creation or even defect level. Well, that's not something uh, very close to, to clean code, but uh, you might say that if we have uh, the right uh, non-functional requirements, then uh, then we can make clean code part of it. ASQ, which is the American Society for Quality, defines it a bit uh, different way. They say that uh, software quality describes the desirable attributes of software products. There are two main approaches exist, defect management and quality attributes. Now here, if we go deeper, we can find a place for, uh, for uh, clean code, but it's still uh, maybe a bit, uh, a bit difficult. If we check what uh, Tom DeMarco said, who wrote uh, some very good books like Peopleware or Structured Analysis and System Specification, he says that the product's quality is a function of how much it changes the world for the better. Now that has nothing to do with uh, how we write uh, code. It has nothing to do with uh, with clean code, at least not uh, not directly. We'll see that uh, we can still reason that indirectly it's uh, it's important. But uh, if you are interested in even more definitions, you can uh, go to to Wikipedia and software quality. You will uh, you will get the link from uh, from the uploaded uh, presentation. There are many very different uh, definitions, and this just uh, just uh, underpins what just supports what uh, Derek Jones said. That well, you might say that software quality is a bit of a meaningless term because uh, so many people, so many organizations define it in uh, in a different way. Now, the the definition I like the most is the one from uh, the Consortium for Information and Software Quality. But uh, they yeah, rather focused on, uh, on structural quality of, uh, of software, which uh, is uh, clearly not uh, the, the functional quality, what, for example, Tom DeMarco more or less uh, explained. And these four pillars are security, reliability, maintainability, and performance efficiency. And uh, we'll see that it's much easier to place clean code into these pillars, into these categories, rather than, uh, than the previous ones. And that's why I took uh, finally this, uh, this definition for, uh, for software quality, for structural software quality. 
But if we want to put uh, clean code somewhere here, if we want to see how clean code helps with, uh, with these pillars, we have to understand what uh, clean code really is. So what's clean code? Let's uh, take a, a simple definition from uh, Gary Woodfine. He said that clean code is code that is easy to understand and easy to change. Now the problem with this definition is that, uh, well, it's very simple. And uh, it's so simple that uh, Maybe it's uh, difficult to, to, to accept it like that or to understand it like that. So let's break it down. Let's break it down into smaller chunks. What should be easy to understand? So we have to understand the execution flow from uh, where we go and uh, to, to where. We have to understand the different uh, relationships between uh, between objects, how they interact with each other. We have to clearly understand their roles and responsibilities. And okay, we don't just have to understand, we have, it should be easy to understand without uh, reading through uh, endless documentations. Just by looking at uh, the code, by reading the code, these things should, uh, should, should be clear. They should strike out of, uh, of the code. Eventually, when you read through the code, you should understand the purpose of uh, each expression, and that's not something, uh, not something easy. So when is it easy to change the code? Well, when classes have uh, small public interfaces, then you understand uh, easily what uh, they are for, what uh, they can do and how. It's also important that the code is easily testable and it is actually tested. It has unit tests because uh, having just uh, easily testable code, well, it's not uh, really enough to have uh, clean code. You should have the unit tests already in place. But uh, I think uh, we, most of us shared this experience that uh, when the code doesn't have the unit tests, when the code doesn't have the tests, Usually it's not something easily testable because it was not written uh, like, uh, like that. And uh, classes and methods should, uh, should be predictable. They should act uh, in a deterministic way. They should always work as, uh, as expected. If they not, then uh, they become difficult to, to change. And uh, your entities, no matter their classes, methods, they should be small and uh, they should adhere to the single responsibility principle, which is something that uh, uh, we often uh, misunderstand, I think, and probably we could dedicate a whole talk to, to the single responsibility principle. But uh, let's say just uh, now that it's not uh, about that it should do like uh, one very single th thing. It's more about that there should be one reason to change a method, one reason to change a class. And that, uh, that's, a, that's a bit different from, uh, from uh, let's say, the, the classical understanding of, uh, of SPR. So with considering that, is clean code part of software quality? And now it's a pity that uh, we don't uh, do this uh, offline because uh, here we could have a good, uh, good discussion. But we had this discussion uh, in, uh, in many of my teams and sometimes uh, the, the answers were, uh, were really astonishing to, to me. And I don't say they are bad answers or good answers, but they are very different answers and they're very different approaches because for some, even if you consider all those, if you consider what uh, software quality is, how we defined with the four pillars, and uh, how we defined clean code, they will say, no, for them, it's just not part. Clean code is just not part of software quality, because as long as the code works without bugs, well, we, it, 
it will always have bugs, but more or less without bugs, or at least uh, without bugs uh, visible or understood by the customers, it's just fine. The user doesn't see your code anyway. Well, it might depend who our users are, or if we deliver uh, some, uh, some library or if we deliver a product, but let's say that uh, they, in general, they don't really see your code. So for them, it's just not part of, of the quality. And uh, many will say that, well, clean code, it's just fun, fun for the developers, something to spend time on with, without uh, delivering uh, something that they can sell, something valuable. And even if uh, many say that, well, it's fun for devs, not every developer uh, finds it so amusing. For, for many, it's uh, just uh, a pain in the back to, to write clean code which uh, makes sense in a certain way because uh, it's not, uh, well, it's not easy to write, uh, write clean code. And uh, even uh, so-called clean coders or senior developers, they also struggle to deliver uh, clean code. So whether you find it amusing, well, it's, uh, <laughs> it depends, uh, depends on you, how you see these things. But for others, and um, I'm, I'm uh, definitely in this group, clean code is part of software quality. It helps reducing the number of bugs. And now if we think about uh, the four pillars of structural software quality, uh, you can uh, think about the reliability and maintainability. So if with clean code, we can write uh, code that has uh, uh, fewer bugs, then clean code must be part of software quality. If it reduces uh, the time to fix bugs, well, uh, it, uh, it definitely increases the maintainability. It makes the code more maintainable because, uh, well, you will still find bugs, but you, find, you, you can identify them and fix them easier then, uh, well, with clean code, you have uh, better quality. And uh, after all, it will really decrease your maintenance cost. So we saw the four pillars and at least uh, maintainability and reliability is uh, directly affected by, uh, by clean code. And uh, it will often, uh, it will often uh, affect also security because if you have uh, clean code, you will uh, find uh, security bugs. Uh, well, not all of them, but uh, many of them more easily. You will recognize them more easily. And uh, even your performance will often be better. Now that's uh, not always the case. And maybe I shouldn't have said that in a C++ conference because uh, we often end up with uh, a bit obscure, uh, pretty much optimized code that uh, is uh, difficult to call clean. But uh, I think we should still understand that the, those are the exceptions. Those are the exceptions, at least uh, in uh, incorporate code where uh, most of uh, your time is, uh, well, it's often spent on the network or uh, spent uh, reading from, uh, from a database, the last thing you will focus on is uh, optimizing the last cycles out of, uh, of uh, some algorithm because uh, it just uh, doesn't matter so much when uh, you have to deal with, uh, with all those database uh, reads and, uh, and network calls. And what matters there is that uh, you, you have something that is easy to understand and uh, something that uh, is easy to follow, easy to follow through the flow when uh, developers come and go and they have to ramp up quickly. So at the end, writing uh, your software uh, clean, writing your, your code clean is part of making uh, your job right. And we'll see that uh, 
making your job right is often more important than uh, than making the right job, which is actually something very surprising. But uh, we'll see some uh, some data for uh, for that just in a couple of slides. So I said that uh, well, clean code is not so easy to write, and while uh, many find amusing, it's definitely not the case for uh, for everyone. So what's the cost? What are the costs of writing clean code? First of all, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes your attention and your care. And uh, these values, time, effort, attention, care, these are values, these are costs that uh, the business uh, usually doesn't really care about. They don't really want to, to pay for these because uh, Well, they might have good reasons sometimes because uh, they uh, have to push the product and uh, if they don't deliver the product, then, uh, well, uh, there is uh, nothing to they can sell and uh, the, the company will not uh, survive. Yes, there are cases like that, but uh, most often it's, uh, it's not the case. Uh, most often we work with arbitrarily arbitrary deadlines and uh, they just don't care about uh, these uh, these values because uh, it's uh, not what is important for them. It's not something that uh, they understand. And I don't even say that it's uh, it's their fault. We'll, uh, we'll see that these are things that uh, we have to explain to, to the business folks, why these things are, uh, are important and why they have to pay. Because uh, what they usually see is this triple constraint of time, cost, and, and scope. And you know, if uh, you move uh, any of these lines, you move any of these uh, connected constraints, if you remove some time or you remove some part of the scope or you try to cut the cost, at the, at the end it's usually, well, okay, it's, uh, it's clean that, uh, well, if you cut a bit the scope, well, you will deliver uh, less functionality. But at the end, what you have in the middle is quality and it will suffer. Usually it's the first thing that, uh, that uh, we sacrifice when uh, we move these two points. I definitely saw good examples. I saw good examples uh, in, uh, in different uh, from different companies, but uh, still, usually, when you move these points, uh, of course, quality will be the first uh, that is sacrificed. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's a pity. That's a pity, and we have a big uh, job to do there. We have to, to, to explain why it's it's not good because uh, it's it's true that uh, the end user doesn't care about the aesthetics of uh, of our code, or uh, if they do it uh, because of their personal reasons. It's not about business reasons. They, they they can't care less about the aesthetics of the code, the beautiful the beauty of the code, or how elegant it is. They only want solutions to their problems. And actually, that's where uh, clean code is uh, is important. Clean code makes sure that uh, you will be able to deliver those solutions on time, in the long run. In the long run, because in the beginning it uh, it might take more time. Because let's see what happens if uh, we write uh, ugly or bad code. So. First, our efficiency will be quite high in the beginning. Okay? We'll start uh, very productive. We'll uh, deliver features uh, very frequently, but then the number of bugs will, uh, will grow. The number of bugs will uh, increase, and uh, the, the time it takes to deliver 
a new feature is uh, is more and more and uh, there are very good uh, examples in uh, in our industry where uh, even even uh, in in developer tools where developers wrote tools for developers but they didn't care about uh, the quality of their code the the cleanliness of their code that they were just not able to deliver changes after a while they were not able to deliver uh, features so at the end when you write bad code well it's just be the end it will be the end of uh, of your product and uh, and uh, there will be your competitors there who focus more on quality and they can still deliver and write the new features. So clean code, I think, is part of software quality. And as I said earlier, it's, uh, it's part of making uh, our job right. And making our job right is more important than you would uh, have thought. So Ellen Kelly uh, worked uh, with some uh, some data collected I think uh, at the MIT about uh, about uh, software quality and uh, and uh, how important it is to write to to do the things right and uh, he called this the alignment trap so in uh, in this uh, in this chart you you see two things, doing things right and doing the right things. And uh, I would say by, uh, by general, uh, by, uh, by default, you would say that hmm, it's more important to do the thing, to, to do the right thing, because if you don't do the right thing, well, you're just uh, wasting time. And uh, while it's, Obvious that uh, the best quadrant is uh, where you do the right things right. So you deliver the right products and you deliver it the right way. If we analyze the data, we will find that those companies who focused on delivering the things right were uh, more uh, were more successful in the long run than those who fall into the alignment trap and uh, they just uh, try to, to deliver the right things. So if you check these numbers, you will see that uh, those who were focusing on the things right, they spent, uh, after all, like 15% less on, uh, on IT costs and uh, they made 11% uh, more sales in three years. Whereas uh, in the opposite quadrant, where uh, they focus on just delivering the right thing, delivering the right thing, they spent more on IT and they had uh, smaller growth. You might ask, okay, but uh, how, okay, it's, it's evident that uh, from the data that uh, making the job right should be the responsibility of all of us then, but why it's the case? And uh, what they found, is that, uh, well, you can easily change what you do. You can change, uh, for example, even if you just think about yourself as an individual software developer, you can easily change your company, well, more or less easily. You can change uh, your, your team, or in fact, you can change uh, what you do at home. That's, uh, that's rather easy, but uh, to change how you do things, to change your habits, that's something very different. It's very difficult to change how you do things. And it's even more difficult to, to change a company culture. You cannot just change it like that. Uh, a leader can go and come and uh, say that, okay, from uh, today we do something else and people will do something else, but they will do it the same way. That's uh, something very difficult to, to change. And that's why it's important to focus on, from the very beginning, uh, on doing uh, the things right. Because uh, if you do the things right, 
then uh, people will notice it and uh, they will communicate with you and uh, they will help you identifying that, well, okay, what you do is really good, but, uh, but maybe you should focus on a bit uh, different uh, features that would be more helpful for us, but we really like to collaborate with, uh, with you. So, but on the other hand, when uh, you just do the things right and uh, you are not really reliable and they see that what uh, you deliver is buggy, well, they will switch uh, at the first uh, possibility when what they have. So at the end, doing the things right, and this is a very important message, is more important than uh, delivering uh, the right uh, thing. <coughs> it will pay off during the long uh, run, sorry. But at the end, who is guilty? You might ask uh, the question. Who is guilty of uh, not delivering clean code? And I saw a few years ago a very long, very heated discussion on LinkedIn on, uh, on this topic. And uh, I analyzed the answers, and uh, there were, uh, they, they fall into three categories. And probably the biggest one was like, it's them the project managers. It's because of our project managers uh, that we don't deliver clean code because they uh, think we are just uh, factory workers. Uh, and uh, well, the, the expression software factory, to be honest, is very often uh, used still. It's still in use. So it, uh, it has its merit that uh, it's them, the project managers because they just want us to keep delivering new features. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's often the case. And uh, many of them, they don't understand what uh, technical debt is, something we haven't even discussed today, what technical debt is, but I'm sure you are familiar with, uh, with the term. And uh, at the end, they don't care about clean code because uh, they don't understand it. And you know, this last one is actually true for most of the project managers. Well, there are project managers who used to be uh, good developers and they, yeah, they became uh, product project managers. They, they understand what clean code is and I guess uh, they, uh, they care more about it, but most, they, they don't and it's true. But is it uh, really a problem that if your project manager the, it doesn't understand clean code. I don't think that's a problem because, well, do you want them to understand uh, inheritance, not to mention virtual and multiple inheritance? Do you really think they should? They should uh, think about immutability. Should they, uh, they, they care about how you do your, uh, your memory allocations, how you manage your memory. Is it their business? Not at all. It's not their business, it's not their job. It's not their job to, to care about uh, clean code. So I think it cannot really be their fault that uh, we don't write clean code. Now there are uh, the other group of people and they were also quite numerous, that it's them, the junior developers. We don't write clean code because of them. Because, well, they don't know how to code well, and uh, we, we just don't have the time to, to fix all their code in, the, in their huge pull requests. And uh, it's, uh, it's just impossible, so at the end, they will integrate their, uh, their ugly code. And, uh, well, as all these complaints, it's, uh, it's partially true. And uh, they don't arrive with, uh, with good enough knowledge. And uh, that's definitely true. That's definitely true. I mean, if I just consider myself how I uh, arrived at, uh, at uh, my first uh, developer job, I, uh, I knew basically nothing. What I wrote was uh, absolutely horrible. And, um, 
and although I received a lot of help, usually I received it uh, a bit uh, bit late, and I, I didn't make me push my code like uh, every day or, or every every few days. And by the time I pushed the code, well, it was uh, really too late to change. So they could say that we could say that it's true that we don't have the time to correct the code. Yeah, they didn't have the time to correct my code. And the number of juniors is exploding. So you cannot even uh, expect that uh, we have uh, time to, to do that. I don't have, I, I couldn't find uh, a very recent data, but a few years ago, they said that the number of developers were doubling every five years. And it just means that uh, there are clearly not enough mentors. We don't have uh, enough time to, to mentor people. I, uh, well, I try to do my uh, my best at uh, at my team with uh, with mentoring, but um, more time would obviously be be better, and uh, we clearly don't have uh, enough mentors. But I still think that uh, we cannot just blame project managers. We cannot just blame junior developers. And uh, if you think about why. We don't deliver clean code. Why? Who is the main reason? Well, it's it's us. And by us, I mean uh, the more experienced developers. It's our fault that uh, clean code is uh, is not delivered, and it's probably our fault if uh, we are really pushed to to write something that uh, we are unhappy with. And uh, to be fair. Uh, the number of years that uh, we have on our resume, the number of years we spent uh, in the same chair will not make us uh, clean coders. Because writing clean code is hard and we have to, to spend time on learning it. It will not uh, come just like, uh, just like that. Because uh, as we mentioned, it requires uh, effort and, and it requires discipline, it requires care. But uh, by general, people, including, uh, including me, including you, including everyone, people are uh, in general lazy and disorganized. And we really have to pay our dues. We really have to focus to learn to write clean code and actually do that in a day-to-day -day job. And... Uh, well, and you speak about the average code. Well, it will be just uh, just average. It's 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 by definition. That's it. Uh, people, on average, in general, they tend to perform in a mediocre level, which is just a synonym for uh, for average. And you have to put some systems in place, uh, hope, usually automated systems uh, in place that will. Uh, help you to write clean code, that will force you, that will discipline you to, to write uh, clean code. And uh, even then, it's, uh, it's, it's not so easy. You need social pressure from, uh, from your teammates. And uh, my personal experience is that when you have only one people, when, when you have only one person in a team who who cares about clean code, then nothing will change. Because uh, people will just say, huh, okay, uh, there is this stranger guy here, and uh, well, we, we, we don't really care. He's always uh, bothering us with uh, his or her uh, uh, design, the test, the code. Well, let's not even invite him to, to, to code reviews. I saw that happening. But uh, when you have at least two people who discuss this regularly in the code reviews, in team meetings, uh, just on the chat, or just they, yeah, they share some, some articles about, uh, not about clean code, but uh, some best practices, then uh, people will pay more attention and actually uh, change uh, is possible then, and uh, it will happen slowly. So you need this, uh, this social pressure. But 
for, for that, in order this to happen, we have to do our job as, uh, as senior engineers. And it doesn't only mean, it doesn't only mean that we have to, to write uh, more code and better code. Because what's, what's our job? What's our job as an experienced developer? What's our job as a senior engineer? Well, of course, we have to write code, hopefully clean code, and we have to write tests. But after all, tests are still code, so we are still there. Okay, we have to write code. But the more senior you are, uh, the less important it is to, to deliver uh, features and code. You have to keep uh, learning, no matter your, uh, your experience is. And you have to communicate. The more you grow, the more you have to communicate. And uh, our job is mostly, I mean, my time, it becomes mostly not about coding, but about communication. We have to be good communicators. And uh, there are many different forms of, uh, of communication. And uh, I uh, don't even claim that I uh, will list half of it, but uh, I try to, to come up with uh, the ones that are most important uh, according to my experience. First, you have to be a good listener. You have to understand uh, the struggles of the others. You have to understand uh, their difficulties. Maybe you will uh, learn that, well, it's not that uh, your, uh, your teammate doesn't care about uh, clean code. Maybe they are just uh, lacking some, uh, some concepts and uh, they don't understand some things, but uh, maybe they don't dare to, to ask. But if you listen closely, you, you will understand that. Or you will understand that they have some, uh, some difficulties at, uh, at uh, home and uh, they just uh, try to, to do their job as, uh, as fast as possible and, uh, and take care of, uh, of the crap that they have. You also have to document. And I don't mean by that that, uh, well, you, you have to keep writing all day long the documentations. And if you are familiar with, uh, with, uh, with the jar, you would tell me now, you would, uh, you would uh, cry at, uh, at uh, the, the, the conference room that, hey, documentation is not uh, so important. What matters is, uh, is working code. And it's true, but we still have to document many things. At least we have to document uh, our intentions. We have to document why we decided to do things in a certain way. And uh, that's, uh, that's also an important uh, part of our job. Not to mention teaching. We, we have to teach the others. We have to help the others to, to get better, to, to raise the bar, and uh, to deliver clean code with uh, with more ease and less efforts is uh, often uh, the result of uh, this type of uh, communication that uh, we do in, uh, in our teams. We have to explain. And uh, when I mentioned teaching, I mostly meant that, well, we have to, to teach our, uh, our less experienced uh, teammates when uh, I focus on, on explanations. I, uh, I more mean to explain uh, even to more senior people or to, to management, to, to the business people, to explain in their own language why things matter. They have to understand that we might take in the beginning a bit uh, more time if there is no imminent uh, market pressure, but they will end up spending much less on, uh, on, uh, on maintenance. And they might actually care about that. And uh, I'm a bit skeptic because uh, I think in corporations, there can be situations when they just don't care about that because, uh, you know, we all change uh, teams every once in a while and uh, they might be focused on, uh, on just delivering those new features because they will get their bonus. And by the time maintenance costs will come in, they, yeah, they, they are disappeared to another company or just to another organization. Well, it's, uh, it's a risk, 
but still we should take our time to explain their own language why it's uh, it's important uh, to for example to write quality or why we do things uh, in a bit sometimes slower but uh, but in a better way we also have to alert them that hey what you do uh, what you want us to do is not going to work and uh, it it happened that we had to raise a red flag in the team that hey what uh, you do is nice, but if you do that, our application will collapse because we just can't uh, can't tolerate uh, one more customer before you you pay for uh, for some re-engineering, for adding new servers, uh, basically to scale the the application. And uh, if you do that uh, in a gentle way, they will listen. They will understand that. Sometimes. And this is also part of documentation, and it's part of our job. We have to say no. We have to say that, sorry, I'm not willing to do that because uh, it's just uh, not uh, matching my personal ethics. And this can be a bit intimidating, but I still think we must say no. And and what can what can go wrong? I mean. Okay, many said, that's why I, I quoted it uh, in that uh, LinkedIn discussion that I referred to about whose fault it is. People said that, well, we have to remind them about the truth. We have to tell them that, uh, no, 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 we cannot do that. And uh, we are not willing to do that. Now others asked, but do we have a mandate? Can we say so? And... Uh, well, of course, there were people saying no, but there were people saying yes. And I definitely think that yes, yes, we do have the mandate. Uh, if they don't trust us, if they tr don't trust our uh, judgment, and if they don't want to listen to us, then uh, we should be ready to, to go. And uh, of course, this can be a bit difficult uh, depending on the market situation, depending on the on, on your personal situation. But uh, for the last uh, couple of uh, years, and many would say that uh, for the last couple of decades, uh, the, the market needs are quite high for experienced software developers. And it's not uh, so difficult to find uh, a better job if you are an experienced uh, developer. You have uh, many options. And uh, if they don't trust you, then uh, you should go to a better place where uh, they will listen to you. But in any case, what can happen if you tell the business that, no, I'm not willing to do that because uh, it uh, will make the application crash, or it's something unethical, or uh, you name the reason? Well. Maybe they will hear you. Maybe they will hear you. Maybe they will agree with you. Maybe they will uh, consider what you said. Maybe they will convince you that uh, actually what uh, they want is, uh, is important and it must be done right now. And uh, then uh, they will focus on uh, what you think is more important. Well, of course, if they always say this and then uh, they forget about it, then uh, probably you won't uh, you won't uh, believe them anymore. Or what you say might uh, get rejected. It's part of life. And uh, after all, don't forget that. Uh, well, what can go wrong? I mean, it's just business. We are talking about uh, business here. You should uh, not forget that uh, it's uh, mostly not about uh, personal relationships. As long as you do it uh, in a polite, in a gentle way, and uh, in a meaningful way with, uh, with most people, it's possible. And uh, most people are capable of, uh, of doing that. And uh, this uh, should be be not personal if you if you say no but if they react in a different way it might actually show you the way that uh, uh, it's a it's a toxic place and uh, and you should uh, you should leave the place 
you will either, either uh, step up to the challenge there or uh, you will say goodbye. Just we have to do what, uh, what we need to do. I mean, after all, you are the expert, you are the senior developer, and you don't ask how to do your job. I mean, hopefully you don't tell your doctor how they should cure you. So don't even, I mean, you don't ask whether you can, uh, you are allowed to write uh, clean code. You, you, you write the code that uh, is good according uh, to, to your standards. And uh, you might uh, be a bit late here and there, but uh, well, usually nothing happens if, uh, if you miss an arbitrary deadline. I don't say it's always possible, but uh, usually it's, uh, it's not a problem. You do what you think is best. And you don't ask uh, permission for that because you are the expert. And I think uh, one more thing that uh, we have to keep in mind when, uh, when we write code, we write clean code and we uh, want to show example for, uh, for uh, our uh, teams is just think about uh, this poster. Well, it's uh, like uh, the, uh, I can't recall, the, the Boy Scout rule. You should leave the campground cleaner than you found it. And uh, you should leave the code a bit cleaner than, uh, than you found, even if you just have to, to update uh, some, uh, some tiny bit of the code. Of course, you will not start a big refactoring because uh, that would also deliver a wrong message, both to the business and both to, to the less experienced colleagues. But you can take the surrounding few lines and, uh, and make things a little bit better. You always leave things a little bit uh, better. And uh, by time, it, uh, it will matter if, uh, you dedicate some some time to to clean up around, then uh, then at the end of the month, at the end of the year, it's going to to make a difference. If you use uh, I don't know like uh, SonarCube for example for static code analysis, and you just uh, fix a couple of things around, it will make uh, it will make the difference. And you need no permission to do that. You don't ask anyone that hey. Can I just check in a bit cleaner code, boss? No, you do what uh, you think is right. And with that, you show example. And uh, with that, we arrived uh, to the conclusion just uh, on, uh, on time. So today we saw that uh, quality is very hard to define, not to mention software quality. Both are, uh, are quite uh, difficult, but we saw the structural software quality uh, which uh, uh, has its, uh, its four uh, pillars like performance, efficiency, reliability, robustness, and uh, maintainability. And uh, clean code is definitely part of that software quality. And uh, we saw that uh, it's actually part of our job to make the things right. It's even more important than doing the right thing. And if you think about your job, well, most often they will tell you what you have to code, but you are the expert. You should know how to do the things uh, right. And uh, that's our responsibility as senior developers. And we have to pass on these values. And uh, in my call to action, I exactly want to, to, to ask you to do that. I'd like you to explain both to your colleagues and uh, to your management, to your product management, that uh, these values matter, that these things that uh, matter, software quality uh, includes clean code and uh, tell them how clean code uh, will leave them with a better software and uh, actually with spending less money on, uh, on maintenance. You have to set your limits. You have to know what you, ex what you accept 
what kind of tasks you accept and what kind of uh, of um, sacrifices you are going to 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 accept in terms of uh, in terms of uh, code quality for example you have to know your limits and you have to be ready to say no when uh, and actually when you set your limits then you become ready to to say no and uh, at the end Remember that uh, as an individual contributor, as, a, as an engineer, you will lead your colleagues by example, with, with all these examples. And uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention. I uh, hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Do we have uh, any questions or shall we directly jump to, to the Zoom? Uh, thanks, Shandor. Uh, you've nicely summarized a lot of thoughts that I had about <laughs> clean code, but you just distilled the essence of this. And I'm I, I stole your that. question. Sorry for that. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like uh, to ask the audience to join us in uh, Zoom, where we're going to ask Shandor a lot of questions. And I have even a couple of things to holy war about. So thank you. Thank you.